It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. The constitutional crisis in Spain and Catalonia is escalating. In response to Catalonia's recent independence vote, Spain's Prime Minister, Mariano Rajoy, has announced he will strip Catalonia's autonomy and remove its leader. The so-called nuclear option is based on Article 155 of Spain's constitution, which allows the parliament to take extraordinary measures to restore order in the country. The move still needs to be ratified by the Spanish parliament. But on Saturday, Rajoy said it's his only option. We applied Article 155 because no government, I repeat, no government of any democratic country can accept that the law is ignored, that the law is violated, that the law is changed, and that all of that is done in an aim to impose their criteria on others. Joining me now is Sebastian Faber, professor of Hispanic studies at Oberlin College, author of the forthcoming book, Memory Battles of the Spanish Civil War. Professor Faber, welcome. If you could explain to us what's just happened over the previous few days. Well, what's happened is that uh, the Spanish government in Madrid has uh, come through with what it said it was going to do, which is to invoke Article 155 of the Spanish Constitution, which is vaguely formulated, but basically allows Madrid to take over any or to revoke any um, the, the self-government of any autonomous region that it considers uh, not living up to its obligations or posing a threat to the interest of the nation. So um, on Saturday, uh, the um, Rajoy, the prime minister's cabinet, came together to discuss this. The question was really, were they going to propose a light, minimal version of taking over this autonomy or a heavy-duty nuclear option? And I think they surprised everybody by going even more nuclear than anybody had expected because they came up with a proposal to completely take over uh, the autonomous government of Catalonia to uh, replace the current president of Catalonia with the prime minister himself and to take over every single department of the Catalan government, including even uh, public television, public radio in Catalonia, which is one of the, uh, along with education and language, is one of the competencies that is devolved to the autonomous communities. So this is a shocking um, package of measures that uh, erases basically with one stroke of the pen um, 40 years of, of um, autonomous government in Catalonia and caused an immediate uh, reaction in, in, um, in Barcelona. It, a, a manifestation had already been planned, but it turned out more massive than it was. And um, currently this proposal that was, was formulated on Saturday is up for a vote for debate and a vote in the Spanish Senate. And that um, debate and that vote are scheduled for this coming Friday. So there are four or five days now in which things might change, negotiation might still happen. Um, it's uh, expected that the Catalan president will appear before the Senate of Madrid and make his case against this Article 155. Um, it's also possible that the Catalan president will take advantage of this short space he has still in which he's actually in charge formally of Catalonia and call for elections, for regional elections. It's not really clear. Now, uh, in the Catalan president's speech, he spoke partly in English in a bid to appeal to the international community. What do you think he was trying to do there, and do you think his overture uh, will resonate uh, across the world? Um, he was trying to, as they, the, uh, Catalonia has been, trying to rally public opinion behind it. Uh, what they're really trying for is some form of recognition by the European Union um, ideally, of course, that Catalonia has the right to, to declare independence. The European Union will never um, concede that. But at least an acknowledgement on the part of the European Union that Spain has a real problem and that the government of Madrid is not solving it in the right way. Even that is not, uh, hasn't happened. So the, the signals coming out of Brussels so far have been, this is a domestic problem. We support the Rajoy government in its application of the constitution, and we don't believe in separatism of any kind. Um, the other uh, question is whether Puigdemont has been able to uh, appeal to international public opinion more widely, so civil societies in the United States, in the European Union. There is clearly some support, I think, among um, especially the left in, uh, in the civilized world, let's say, 
for what Catalonia is trying to do. Um, it's not clear really to what extent public opinion will be, uh, international public opinion will be able to apply pressure and to such an extent that it will really force the Rajoy government to change course. I think one of the weak points um, for the Rajoy government, to be honest, is the the low quality of its public servants. The, um, for example, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dastis, appeared on the BBC the other day, claiming that many of the images that we'd seen of police cracking down on voters in October 1 in Catalonia were fake news, and the BBC journalist couldn't really help sort of uh, laughing at this ridiculous claim by the Spanish foreign, uh, foreign minister. Um, so there's a, a way in which the credibility of the Rajoy government abroad um, is low, even among EU leaders. But that doesn't mean that those EU leaders will uh, let go of their basic position, which is that this is a, an internal domestic problem and that the only law that applies is the constitution in Spain. Right, but one issue for Puigdemont, I imagine, too, is the domestic situation. I mean, the referendum was overwhelmingly approved, according to local authorities, but turnout was less than 50 percent. And meanwhile, also, um, isn't this also fueling some economic uncertainty with businesses now saying that they're considering pulling out of Catalonia because there's too much unrest? Yeah, thousands of businesses have made a gesture of pulling out in the sense that they sort of changed the uh, their main address, not not quite their headquarters, but the, the, the main address, out, they moved it outside of Catalonia. That has happened a lot. Um, that's a real fear. Um, the, the effect of some kind of economic or corporate exodus out of Catalonia is a real fear, and that would really destabilize, and it's already destabilizing the Catalan economy. And you're also right that um, Puigdemont, in strictly um, legal terms, is his position is not too strong, because even though 90% of the people who voted on October 1 voted in favor of independence, they made up slightly over 40% of the uh, people eligible to vote. And it's also true that the Spanish constitution does not allow for a referendum and self-determination, let alone secession. So he re really, all he's got is the, uh, the force of, of moral indignation and, and potentially the support of international public opinion. What he's really after is still, to me, not quite clear. Um, it's not self-evident to me that he or at least his party really wants independence and believes in independence and ultimate goal. I think uh, for them, an acceptable solution would be some kind of, kind of negotiated outcome whereby Catalonia's position within Spain would be defined more along the lines that they'd like to see it, would be more beneficial to Catalonia, would strengthen um, self-rule. Um, some of his, his coalition partners in this broad pro-independence coalition, especially the, the coup, the, um, the, the more uh, far left partner, um, will not likely accept that as a, as, a, an ex, as, a, as a positive outcome of this process. So Puigdemont, like you say, has to struggle with his lack of legal uh, standing, but also with potential, uh, a, a potential breakup of, of the coalition that he heads up. Right. You know, if I recall correctly, in a previous interview, um, you were pointing out that Puigdemont might have a sort of uh, political motivation in this independent struggle in the sense of uh, you know, shoring up domestic support for his leadership as a way of rallying his people around him versus necessarily being so committed to the actual goal of independence. Yeah, no, th that is true. I think uh, both parties, both main parties, the Partido Popular, the Rajoy's party in Madrid, and which the one party in Catalonia are in this game in part to gain votes or not to lose votes in any case. I think it's important. To, I think if I, might, if I can make one other point, Please. Um, I think beyond the motivations and the short term goals of these politicians, uh, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that the, the Catalonian problem, the crisis of Catalonia, is really a crisis of Spain and it's a deep constitutional crisis of leg legitimacy which is really the next chapter in, in something that we started, we saw start in 2011 with the Indignados movement, the 15M movement. And currently in Catalonia, you could say that the general discontent with the state of democracy in Spain and, and the caliber of democracy in Spain is currently finding a vehicle in the cause for independence. Mm. But that's just a vehicle for a much deeper crisis that the invocation of Article 155 this Saturday only confirms, right? Because 
if people are discontent with the level of democracy, the level of participation, the corruption of the political parties, the rigidity of, of the judicial and, and executive and legislative structures in Spain, then uh, basically scratching democracy altogether for the, for the sake, in the name of the constitution, only goes to show that the system is really broken and needs to be fixed in some way. Mm. And you know, on that point, I'm wondering if, again, this opens up um, some space for Podemos, the anti-austerity movement that's arisen in the last uh, few years, um, being able to reach the people both in Spain and Catalonia with their message uh, as an alternative to the Spanish government, especially in the aftermath of the Spanish government cracking down so brutally on the Catalonian vote uh, when it happened just a few weeks ago. Yeah, in, in principle, uh, I agree with you. There is an opening. I think um, a key element here is, is political capital or political credibility. Um, it's really hard at this point in Spain, given the escalation, um, the escalation which has really trickled down to civil society. So the division over Catalonia is not just political. It really is it's splitting families, friendships, and political parties as well, including Podemos. So this is a really hard landscape to navigate for any political party that isn't already committing to either being strongly in favor or strongly against self-determination in Catalonia. So in principle, I would agree with you that there's an opening for a more recent, more broad critique of the system as it is and a call for reform of that system. But the way that emotions have been mobilized at this point and the way that uh, political allegiances have been mobilized by the parties um, that which sit, occupy the extreme points of the debate about Catalonia makes it really hard for Podemos to, um, to, to break down that, that, that divide and to take a, some kind of middle road, even though it, would be, it is the one that makes the most sense in the long term. Right. So as we uh, wait to see how the Spanish Senate votes, uh, what's your prediction uh, for what's going to happen? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I would say, uh, I would say that Madrid doesn't really want to apply 155, and the way they've they've lined it out in such an incredibly radical overhauling way is practically pretty tough to actually implement. For example. Just today, the employees of the Catalan public television system already declared they will not obey any orders coming from Madrid. They will obey coming orders for coming from the Catalan parliament. So I think the uh, set of measures outlined on Saturday were meant to be a threat, uh, a threat that is not actually possible to really implement. And therefore, I think that both the threat of the Declaration of Independence on the side of Catalonia and the threat of complete entire crackdown from Madrid are still meant as part of a negotiation of some sort of forcing the other party to buckle. Um, and I think that both parties secretly hope on some kind of negotiated, uh, have, have hopes that there'll be some kind of negotiated solutions. The problem is a little bit that politically both have to save face in that solution. So that's gonna be a very hard, very hard narrative to tell uh, on both sides. So it's not really a prediction, I guess, but it's, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to, still hard to say what's gonna happen. Should the crackdown really happen? Uh, should Madrid uh, keep its word and, and, and the Senate approve the set of measures that, that were outlined on Saturday? I think uh, in Catalonia, there'll be entire and utter chaos. I mean, even, for example, the, the police force, the Mossos de Squadra, the Catalan-wide, Catalonia-wide security apparatus will be divided in its loyalties and will be split between obeying uh, Catalan authority or obeying, obeying, obeying Spanish authority. So the, the recipe is really for total chaos in, in all respects of, of civil life and public life and security and economics. On that ominous note, we'll leave it there. Sebastian Faber, professor of Hispanic studies at Oberlin College, author of the forthcoming book, Memory Battles of the Spanish Civil War. Professor, thank you. Sure. And thank you for joining us on The Road News.